In lieu of a reading today, and in keeping with the Couch by Couch West tradition, we have an encore from Pete and Paul. Take it away. Coffin is a neuroscience professor at WSU Vancouver and president of ScienceTalk.org. Her research focuses primarily on hearing loss in humans. If you look up her Twitter feed, you will find one of the most charming videos I have ever seen showing babies with impaired hearing reacting after being fitted with hearing aids for the first time. Allie, as she likes to be called, once took a fish biology course in which she learned that some fish produce sounds for things like chasing away other fish or attracting mates. In midshipman fish, the female's hearing improves dramatically 
during the mating season. Fascinated by those bits of information, she continued to learn about the mating habits of more than fish, hence her topic this morning. Dr. Coffin isn't all about science. She motorcycles, plays softball, and enjoys her cats, even when one curls up on her keyboard, hindering digital communication. But biological science is her life's work. And one of the more intriguing aspects of biology is mating. I'm pleased to welcome to HGP's Zoom platform, Allie Coffin. Yay. All right. Thank you very much, Joyce, and good to be with everybody again. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all virtually. Definitely the Couch by Couch West theme. Go ahead and start screen sharing here. All right, everybody seeing the slides? Fantastic. We didn't have a chance to check, check all the technology first, so hopefully all of the audio and video will work as well. We'll see how this goes. So as Joyce was saying, this talk is really not about the birds and the bees, but really about the birds and the fish. And my goal for today is to bring in some of the science behind some of the interesting mating habits of a couple of different species, but also just to entertain a bit. So this is really just as much, I think, about the stories of the crazy things these animals do as about the biology behind them. Because I don't know about you guys, but I know I'm looking for a few more stories these days to kind of take me out of where I'm at now. So I realize that dating is very different in the current age, but imagine being an animal where there are no online platforms. There's no Tinder to swipe left or right. And sometimes it's really hard to find and keep a mate. And keeping isn't always the optimal strategy with animals, often it's not, but even the finding can be very challenging. So today I'll tell a few stories, not about these lions, I just happen to like lions, but about, like I said, some birds and then some fish and some of the interesting things they do. And I'll definitely be anthropomorphizing a bit and drawing some parallels between, at least in birds, some of the things that they do and some of the things that humans do. But I think some of those comparisons will be pretty obvious. Hold on a second. So starting out with a very simple strategy, the pickup line. And definitely not advocating for any Will Ferrell movies, but we see this a lot in birds as well. And we'll start with the simplest version, which is the whistle. So first you guys will have to let me know whether or not you hear the audio. So um, some of us, particularly some women have heard this before. You got the audio? All right. And what I think most of us know, either those that love birds or those that like to sleep in and wish the birds would just be quiet sometimes, is that birds do a lot of whistling as well. So I'd like to play a few different sounds from two different related species of flycatcher. The first is the alder flycatcher. I'll give you that one more time. The second is the willow flycatcher. which you could also tell sounds a bit like that wolf whistle coming from that human example. Now, what's really interesting about these two species, first of all, they're both using these whistles or calls to attract potential mates, but also that just based on anatomy and based on, on visual presence, it was originally thought that these were two, the, these were the same species. And it wasn't until studies about the different calls of these birds that ornithologists realized that they actually were different species of flycatcher. And the females prefer the call of their own species. This is really the simplest example, or one of the simpler examples of that first sort of behavior, the whistle. So let's look at something that is a little bit more complex, and that is the song. So, Dating myself a little bit here, but I suspect there are a number of people that remember this movie, Top Gun, when Maverick and Goose are singing to attract a woman. 
And we know that songbirds do this as well. So again, now we're looking at white crowned sparrows and I'd like to play you a clip of their song. And what songbirds, most songbirds have, it's what's known as a stereotype song. So they learn one song and they sing that song or a very similar version of that song throughout the breeding season. And in songbirds like the white crowned sparrows, while the females will vocalize some, it's really the males that are singing, that are vocalizing to attract females, to establish their territory and attract females to that territory. And we know that songbirds need to, like the white crowned sparrows, need to learn their song in order to produce it effectively. So and this is a study done several years ago. And what you're seeing here now is the sound spectrogram. So along the bottom here is time and along the side or the y-axis is frequency, sound frequency or pitch. And so just looking at these, what you can see is that a bird that is raised with, so that this, they took young male white crowned sparrows and they either raised them with another adult male, so an older male of the same species, or in the bottom, they raised them in isolation where they didn't have a chance to hear the male song of their species. And you can see then that these two songs just look very different in that the male raised in isolation, does, he, he, he sort of figures out bits and pieces of it. There's this bit at the beginning that is at a particular frequency, and then the pitch goes up, but it doesn't look much like or sound much like the song of the male that is raised either with an adult male of the same species or in the lab, we can manipulate this in such a way. And by we, I mean my colleagues, I don't study birds, but to play the song of the male without actually having the male present. And there've been a lot of different studies as well, taking songs of different species of males, playing them to a young male bird in isolation and seeing what kinds of songs they learn. And we also know that these white crowned sparrows and other songbirds need auditory feedback in order to learn this song. So if a young bird is deafened, even after it learns the sparrow's song and has heard it, if it can't hear itself practicing, then the song doesn't turn out the same way. It doesn't sound like it should for that species and that bird will have a harder time attracting a mate. And that's not the case for all animals that vocalize. Among mammals, for example, we know that humans need auditory feedback in order to learn our vocalizations properly. But mice, for example, which, is our, which are a really common species to study in the lab, mice don't need auditory feedback in order to learn their proper squeaks. So songbirds actually are a great model for understanding human language learning as well because they have to learn it from somebody else of the same species and they need to be able to hear themselves in order to practice and perfect that song, just like we do with speech. Now, what's also interesting now with songbirds and different from how we operate, oh, sorry, the, getting ahead of myself here. So this is just showing that not all birds sound exactly the same. So here, again, we have a male that was raised in isolation and it was raised listening to that Sparrow Tudor song across the top, but then it was, then tested later to see what its song looked like. And you can see that the song looks similar to that tutor. So it has this kind of constant frequency bit at the beginning and then the frequency goes up. And there's this kind of buzz up. And then a lot of the notes or syllables as they're called are similar, but it's not exactly the same. So even though this is the song of the same species, it learned it from the tutor, it's still unique. We each have our own little speech differences or properties. And so this young male down here on the bottom is singing the right song, the right species, but it's still adding its own twist. Again, very similar to what humans do. But what's interesting is, like I was saying, unlike us, where we're talking year round, and if you ask my husband, he would say I'm talking too much year round, that, and he's probably right, I'll give him credit for that one, that songbirds aren't, don't need to sing the same song year round. So there's the breeding season. So in the Northern hemisphere, usually in the spring and the summer, and in the non-breeding season in the winter, the males aren't calling to attract females. 
And so this is songbirds taken, and these were actually, I believe, recorded in the lab, where we can see during the breeding season, the song is what we call very stereotyped. So three different instances of the same song from the same bird, the, different, the same syllables are present. And this third one down here at the bottom on the breeding, we can see that this last little buzz here was cut off. But in general, the bird is singing the same song in this very repetitive stereotyped fashion. And we know that females are listening for that stereotyped version for that, that same repetitive song. Whereas in the non-breeding season, the same songbird, it's still singing, but it looks really and sounds really different. And so there are these seasonal changes or what we call seasonal plasticity in songbird song, where during the off season, when the male doesn't need to be attracting a female, his song gets a bit sloppy. And there are changes in the brain that accompany these changes in breeding or non-breeding season. So a lot of this obviously is going to be hormonally driven. And some work done actually at the University of Washington in Eluit Brenowitz's lab looked at regions of the songbird brain that are necessary for producing those vocalizations, for producing the song. And what they did is they looked for two different types of cells or one type of cells and one feature. So in red here on this picture on your left, the red are nerve cells, neurons. And the green then are newly born cells. So what they did is they introduced a substance into the bird that will bind to DNA as that DNA is dividing. And it then labels newly born cells. And in this case, in the brain, newly born neurons. And what you can see over here on the right in this graph is if we look specifically in the regions of these birds that are important for producing sound, they have more new nerve cells. So cells that are both red and green in the brains during the breeding season than in the non-breeding season. And we know that this is driven by hormones, primarily testosterone in these birds. And so that's showing us that the seasonal plasticity is in large part driven by neuronal plasticity and production of new neurons in the brain and then likely new connections between those neurons and existing neurons to form these circuits to, that really drive song. And I think that's one of the really fascinating things about birds. And our brains don't work quite this way in that we're not constantly gaining and losing neurons seasonally like these birds are, but we do know that in us as well, we produce new neurons throughout adult life. That's actually only science from the last 20 or so years. It was pr previously thought that humans did not continue to make new nerve cells throughout life. And now we know that we do. But we also know that things like new experiences and exercise and sleep actually all drive additional production of these new nerve cells which can then contribute to our own learning. So a little bit of a side, even though I'm not showing you those data, which is the exercise and the sleep and the sorts of things that I think a lot of us are maybe not as good with right now during this crazy time are really important for our health in many ways, including generating new neurons in the brain, helping us form con new connections and learn new things. So this, is the, this was the song. Remember we started with the whistle? Now we've moved on to the song. Now we're gonna get a bit more intense. And this is one of my favorite bird stories. So let's say that you are an individual considering a potential mate. Whose bedroom would you prefer? And I should have set this up as an actual poll, but it's a little bit too late now. So we can see that we have these uh, three different choices. The one on the left, which if you're into music, there are guitars. And so maybe that's going to be really attractive for some people. This nice hotel looking room in the center or the very blue nautical themed room on the right. And if you are a satin bower bird, you will pick the room on the right every time because for them, it's all about blue. This is our satin bowerbird. These are found in Australia. 
and some colleagues of mine from the University of Maryland and now at UC Davis have spent years studying these birds and they have really interesting suites of mating behavior. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with this story. Here we have a sat male satin bower bird decorating his bower. So the bower is the grassy bits right here. And that's actually where the female will hang out as she's observing the male. And the male is decorating with blue. And as you can see in this picture with the straws and the bottle caps, there, there's a feather here and a feather here. So obviously these birds were decorating with blue long before we invented plastic. But you can see the influence that human invention has had on their decorating habits when you take a look at just how much plastic stuff is in this bower. So what will happen is the females will come by the bower during the breeding season. Usually when the male isn't around, they'll come by the first time and they'll literally just check out the bachelor pad. See how much blue stuff he has, how it looks. So the male spent a lot of time arranging their blue decorations, stealing blue decorations from each other. It really is about who has the most blue things scattered in front of his bower. If she's impressed with the blue decorations, she'll come back a second time when he is there and she'll stand in this area in the center of the grass and watch him perform. And he will do a song and dance back and forth like he's on a stage in front of that female. If she's still interested, she may agree to mating then, she may come back one more time, check him out again, and then decide to mate with that male. So it really is a three date policy with these birds. And there are a number of different things that she's looking for in that if he has a lot of blue decorations, likely he is a successful male because he has collected those decorations. He has possibly stolen or borrowed those decorations from other bower birds and he has then defended them. And so those are all indications of male quality. That's showing that this is a big vigorous male who's likely healthy and whose sperm would produce good offspring because that's really what the female bower bird cares about. And we see that so often in sexual selection and mate choice. That's the important trait. But that also then she's interested in the vigor of his song and dance. So I'm gonna show, hopefully, I'm gonna try to play this video if it doesn't work, not a big deal, but there's a fun little video. Like I said, this is some science and some edutainment here. So we'll see if this works. But there's more to this thievery than brute force. Now, animal theft has become so sophisticated, we've entered the realm of organized crime. This male Australian satin bower bird is only interested in stealing things that are blue special client, the female bowerbird. This thatched bower is a seductive bachelor pad where the mood must be right for them. The male's pilfering is driven by the female's passion for all things blue. Visiting all the males in the neighborhood, she'll judge them on their home decorating flair. Okay, that's enough of that video, but I think you guys get the idea, as I was saying, really, the males go out of their way to decorate, and you can also see in that video that sometimes males are taking things that humans might miss, so money, for example. So once the, the female is there, then the male will perform, and there aren't as many blue decorations in this one, but this is a, a video actually shot in the late 90s by by some of my former colleagues that shows what the male song and dance looks like once the female has decided to stay in his bower and observe him.
Uh oh. What you could see the the song and dance of that male flower bird. Oh, and as I said, the female then is going to be observing his behavior for a few different things. She's looking for that song and dance. But what's also interesting with these birds, and I'm just going to talk because I'm bringing this up at the same time. What's also interesting in these birds is that there, there are age specific differences in female preference. All right, we got the slides back for everybody? You guys are seeing those again? Cool. So the younger females are more attracted to the blue decorations. And that seems to be a large part of how they pick their mate. The older females, or more experienced females, to anthropomorphize, realize it's not all about the bachelor pad. And they're more interested in the intensity of his display of that song and dance. The most successful males are the ones that are sensitive to the female's behavior and will modulate their behavior based on subtle cues from the females. So in this example then, this was a study done by a, this colleague of mine from graduate school, actually Gail Patricelli, who's now at UC Davis. And what you're looking at here then across the bottom is startle rates, the amount of time the female kind of raises her wings, showing that the male's display is getting a little too intense for her. And then along the side here, courtship success. And you can see there's an inverse correlation. So the more she startles, the lower his chances. And then there's also in another interesting part of this study. If you look at male responsiveness, how much he modulated his display to her startling, she startles less. So the more responsive the male, the less she startles. If we go back to this first graph, the less she startles, the higher his chances of courtship success. So it really is about the more experienced males. The more experienced males have more experience of going, oh, she's fluffing her wings. I'm going to dial it back. So the younger females are looking at the blue decorations. If he gets too intense, she's going to get scared off. The older males, more experienced at noticing these females' behaviors. And the older females also, and that's not shown here, the older females, less likely to startle. So a lot of really interesting dynamics going on here. And I think many of us can draw at least a lot of mental parallels to a lot of human behavior as well. So one more part of this study, as I was saying, this is a, a former grad school colleague of mine, Gail Patricelli. She did something really interesting here and she built RoboBird. So this was back almost 20 years ago now. And so this is a, a fairly primitive by modern standards robo bird, but it looks very realistic because she took the outside of a female bower bird who had passed away and put robotic controls inside it. And then because this was 20 years ago, she couldn't control it remotely. So she actually had to lay in the bushes in Australia with a cord and control this female bird's behavior. And this was really to get at this idea of how much is the female startling and how responsive are different males of different ages to this startle. And she could control her robo bird as it fluffed its wings or not. So we'll, I'll show this video and hopefully my computer won't crash again. So this is robo bird. You can see she's only got one leg, but she's moving, doing, doing some bird like things. And then pretty soon the male will show up. an example actually of how Gail got some of those data that I already showed where she was looking at males responsiveness part of that was from observation part of that was from using her robo bird to then place the robo bird in the bowers of different aged males that presumably had different experience to see how well they could modulate their behavior when she controlled her female bower bird to fluff its wings and startle or not and I will say and you can clearly see that th this male bower bird was convinced that that female was an actual female bowerbird. And often the male bowerbirds would attempt to mate with robo-female. So 
they definitely were convinced of the reality of her robot. So what I want to do now is move on from birds to fish. And so these bird stories, I always feel like sound somewhat familiar, whereas the fish stories, I think, are where they really get weird. So now we're going to be talking about some aquatic dating strategies. And we'll start with the well, just a, a few examples from a few different species. So starting out with um, wrasse in this case, but many different species which spawn in groups. So rather than one male, one female, you either have many males and females, or often in the case of the species of wrasse, which are these Indo-Pacific reef fish, that it will be one or a few males and many females. And spawning is determined by water temperature and phase of the moon and day-night cycle as well. So how much daylight there is relative to darkness because they're going to spawn at certain times of year. And then these fish will do this rush where all of the fish will rush up to towards the surface at once. And you can see this little cloud right here. And that's eggs and sperm being released into the water by this rush of spawning fish. And so this is external fertilization. Obviously not every egg is going to find a sperm, but the strategy is just produce enough gametes, produce enough eggs and sperm, get them all together in a similar space at about the same time and spawning happens. And this is definitely a successful strategy. There are a lot of different species of fish that do this, but the wrasse are a really interesting example in that there are two different forms of, of wrasse, actually three different forms of wrasse. There are, so there are males and females, but there are primary males, females, and terminal males. And this is one of these species that changes sex. So now we're getting into what's called sequential hermaphroditism. So hermaphrodite being having both female and male gonads, so being able to produce both sperm and eggs, and sequential being going from being one biological sex to the other through the course of the animal's lifetime. So in this species, this yellow fish here, in this case is a female, but there are also animals that are born primary males. So they're born looking very similar to this female and they're also going to be less colorful. Whereas the terminal male is this guy over here with the big blue head. And this is the blue head wrasse. So you can see where the species gets their name. In, in the primary males, so these smaller males, they resemble females throughout their life. And you'll see this again a little bit later in the talk. There are a number of different species that do this, that have two different versions of males. And they basically masquerade as females. Whereas this terminal male, the big guy with the blue head, what he'll do is he'll establish a territory on a reef and gather a harem of females and defend his territory, swim around and chase away the other terminal males. And then during the breeding season at certain times of year, then they all rush up to the surface. And he then in exchange for defending a territory, trying to keep the females safe, will have the opportunity to mate with many females at once in this harem during those spawning rushes. But there are also these primary males and they have relatively large testes relative to body weight. And so they produce a lot more sperm and they resemble these females and they'll join in these spawning rushes as well with the strategy being that they don't defend a territory, but they sneak in, they release sperm lots and lots so that they're stealing fertilizations from this big guy who has been defending the territory. But the big guy, this blue headed, the actual terminal male with the blue head started life as a female. These primary males, they're born male, they stay male. Whereas with the females, when the terminal male, the big blue headed male is removed from that harem, the largest female in the group will become a male. And we don't know all of how that happens. Oh, first I'll just show you. Yeah, I think I'm gonna skip the video because those have been crashing. And we don't know how all of how that happens, but we know that it, it, it involves a regulation of stress and hormones. And we also know there's a second example, and this one might be a bit more familiar. And this is from Finding Nemo, or should have been from Finding Nemo. So hopefully some of you guys 
remember Nemo and remember Nemo, our clownfish, and Dory, his friend. And in clownfish, these experience the sex change in the opposite direction. So they go from being male to being female. In blue-headed rafts, it's thought that the strategy is that the big terminal male, as I said, he's defending a territory. So being large is important for territory defense, for protection of that space and of mating opportunities within it. Whereas in clownfish, their territory is a sea anemone. And you can see that over here on the right with our pair of clownfish. And here's our, our female here. And in this species and in species of clownfish in general, the females are larger. They're not defending a large territory. They have one anemone. They're relatively safe in that anemone because the anemone has stinging cells on its tentacles that these fish are resistant to. So as long as they're hanging out within the safety of their anemone or near it, they're safe generally from other species. And there are usually enough anemones on these reefs where these fish settle, where, where they, they mature and spawn that there isn't a lot of competition for anemones. And so in this case, the females are larger and that's thought because it's more energetically costly to produce eggs than it is to produce sperm. The eggs are a lot larger. They contain a very energy rich yolk that will nourish the embryo as it's developing. And so larger body size then is correlated with producing more and higher quality eggs, which will lead to better survival of the offspring. And that's why it's thought that in these species, the females are larger. And so earlier in the life cycle, the animal's male, and then there'll be one female, a mature male, and some juveniles, and juvenile males on the anemone. If you remove that female, then the largest male will undergo a, a sex change, sequential hermaphroditism, to become a female. Which also means that the movie Finding Nemo wasn't exactly right. Because if you remember Nemo's mother was gone and Nemo was with his father and that just means that when Nemo's mother died, Nemo's father should have turned into Nemo's mother. But that probably doesn't work so well for a kid's movie. So how does this actually work? And we don't know all of the details yet. And I'm sure some people know more of those details than I do, but we know that it's dependent on these two primary sex hormones, so testosterone and estrogen. And this enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase is an enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. We have aromatase as well. Estrogen, even in males, we have estrogen in our bodies that acts locally on our cells to drive different events going on inside our cells. And in the bluehead wrasse, so in the species where we have one big terminal male and a number of smaller females, the current hypothesis is that normally we've got our male who's making estrogen and our smaller female, or testosterone, our smaller females making estrogen. And that in addition to mating with these fish, he's, he's chasing them around a bit, trying to get them to mate and that's stressing them out. And so stress and stress hormones like cortisol are driving the production of aromatase. Aromatase turns testosterone into estrogen. So in these females, they're stressed out, they're making a lot of aromatase, which is then producing a lot of estrogen. If you remove the male, these fish are less stressed. That means they make less aromatase, which then means then that they were all producing some testosterone. If the aromatase isn't there, it's not converting testosterone to estrogen. So there's less estrogen, more testosterone, shifting the balance, which means then that there's going to be a shift in that testosterone. Testosterone levels go up, which is going to then convert this female into a male. And this process likely starts in a few of the females in the harem at once, but the largest female, as her testosterone levels increase, she's going to get more aggressive. She's going to start chasing the other females. That's then going to increase their stress levels again, which will then cause them to resume making aromatase and lead then to more estrogen production. Whereas in clownfish, it seems to be the reverse. So remember here, we're starting with males converting to females, that in this case, the, the baseline state is producing testosterone and not making, estro not making aromatase. Whereas when we remove that female 
and we still don't exactly know how this happens, aromatase turns on, now estrogen is made, and you now get a female. So if that was somewhat confusing, I'm not really going to apologize because the actual mechanisms are confusing of how these processes happen, how aromatase is turned on and off. But the bottom line is testosterone male, estrogen female, aromatase modulated by stress and environmental factors to control those sex changes in different directions depending on the species. So that was sequential hermaphroditism. Now I want to give a brief example of simultaneous hermaphroditism. So being male and female at the same time, and there are only, I believe, two vertebrate species that we know of that are simultaneous hermaphrodites as really a matter of biological strategy. And the most well studied is the mangrove killifish, and the other is a related species of killifish. And these guys are found in Florida and in some other parts of, of estuary systems, and they can self-fertilize. So essentially what they're doing then is they're making clones of themselves where their own eggs and sperm are coming together to produce exact copies of that parent. And this is what's called the ovotex testes of a mangrove killifish. And when I say ovotestes, that's because they have ovaries and testes at the same time. So you can see the O here is ovary, the T is testes. Don't worry about those couple other letters. And you can see that the ovary and the testes are right next to each other. So again, this is internal self-fertilization in this species, which you would think would be kind of an evolutionarily bad strategy because if you can only make a clone, then how do you adapt to change? Because the point really of sexual reproduction is combining genetic information from two different individuals so that there's variability in a population. Whereas if you're self-fertilizing, you're losing that variability. Well, so they don't only self-fertilize. They have a few different options. So again, this is where things get complicated. And so we know during develop early development in this species that whether an animal becomes a hermaphrodite or a male is determined by temperature. So early in development then at a what's considered their optimal temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, they are hermaphrodites. Whereas if it's too cool or actually too warm, they become males. And this way then, that, and that male then can fertilize the eggs from a hermaphrodite. So now we're introducing genetic variability into the population. And similarly, if uh, there's a fish who is a hermaphrodite, and the temperature fluctuates. In this case, in this experiment, they raise the temperature and you can see by only a few degrees, again, you get a male. And so that's a secondary male. That's a fish that started life as a hermaphrodite. And then the ovaries regressed with that increase in temperature and the animal became male. And so these are animals that live in these small, highly temperature dynamic pools of water that can be isolated at times in the mangroves, depending on where the water level is at, how much rain there's been. And so at optimal conditions, being a hermaphrodite is actually a successful mating strategy because if environmental conditions are optimal, you don't need as much genetic variability in the population for the population to continue. Whereas the changes in temperature then are going to, to drive evolutionary pressure, drive this need for more genetic variation in the population to adapt to suboptimal environmental conditions, in this case, suboptimal temperature. So now we wind up with males that can then fertilize the eggs of the hermaphrodites. That's now two different fish coming together, genetic recombining, more variability. So it's really an interesting adaptive strategy for self-fertilization under optimal conditions, but sexual mating and recombination under suboptimal conditions. And so I think one of the themes that's probably com that's coming out throughout the talk is that these mating strategies are all about evolution and male quality and female choice in some cases, particularly for birds, but really for recombination of genetic material 
for optimal survival of offspring and of the species. Now, speaking of optimal survival and finding mates, one story that I'd like, so two final stories that I'll share here in these last few minutes. And this next one is where things I think get even weirder. I'm gonna skip that. And that is deep sea anglerfish. Anybody heard of these guys? Right, so in deep sea anglerfish, imagine a deep, dark, fairly barren environment, basically an underwater desert where it's really hard to find a mate. And in this species, and not just this species, but in many deep sea anglerfish, so this group of fishes, the female is large, has these sharp teeth. When you think about these kind of deep sea fish and you've seen these, we're thinking about the females. She also has this light emitting organ called an esca. It's at the end of a long stalk. Can be used to attract prey. You can see it's hanging right in front of her mouth. So smaller fish are attracted to that. There's a mouth with large teeth right behind that. But the males are much smaller and they will find a female attached to her and in many of these species form a permanent attachment. So they will attach with their teeth and then the skin around the male's jaw fuses with the female and his digestive system starts to degenerate and his vascularization, his blood vessels fuse with hers. So he's now drawing nutrients off of the female. His testes stay intact and his job now is to produce sperm for that female in a permanent, somewhat parasitic relationship. And it's thought that this is an adaptive strategy in the deep sea where finding a mate is exceedingly challenging. And so the best evolutionary strategy is to find one and hold on for the rest of your life. And in some species, you'll actually find multiple males on the same female. And that really depends on the species. So just a, another little fun fish fact there. And finally, one last story. And this actually gets at some of my own research. And this is these plain fin midshipman fish that Joyce alluded to earlier on during my introduction. These are fish that are found here in the Pacific Northwest. So the yellow circles here are along our coast and that's the range of these plain fin midshipman fish. The green is another related species of midshipman. I think these guys are beautiful. Some of my colleagues have said they're really ugly. I will leave that up to you to determine your own level of appreciation of these fish. They get their name from this pattern of photophores of light emitting organs on the underside. So this is the belly of a midshipman fish and you can see these little dots here. And it's thought that that pattern resembles the pattern of buttons on a naval midshipman's jacket, which is where they draw their name. These fish are really fascinating in that, again, they call to attract mates. So not so much like the songbird, it's not a learned song, it's nothing fancy, it's a bit more like that first whistle. So we're kind of going full circle from the whistle at the beginning to the whistle at the end of the talk in these fish. And we go out and we collect these fish. So the picture on the left is showing a group we were out on a boat, in this case in Puget Sound, collecting these fish during the winter months. So the non-breeding season, and here I am holding one of these, so you can actually see the scale of the fish relative to me. And that looks to be a female. And it, during the non-breeding season, these fish are found in about 60 to 100 meters of water, so a few hundred feet down, and they bury in the sand. And you can actually see, like, if you look at the, this fish on the top here, where the eyes are positioned, those are nicely positioned so that a fish buried in the sand will still be able to see what's going on by looking around at the surrounding environment. And then in the summer, they come into these intertidal areas to breed. And so here we are near Port Townsend on the Olympic Peninsula, myself and my collaborator, Joseph Neros, who's been studying the species for 20 years. And we are literally up picking up rocks in this intertidal zone at low tide, where the male has hollowed out a nest, 
nothing nearly as fancy as, ba as a bower, basically. He's just kind of wormed his way in there, or fished his way in there. And then at night, these males will sing to attract females. And we can go out at low tide and collect them because they're literally found in just these little sandy pools under rocks in this oyster bed. And I'm really hoping that our collecting permit for this year comes through. We just got a four-year National Science Foundation grant to study this species. Field season starts in the next few weeks. Obviously, we can't get out right now, but we're really hoping that our permit will be approved by June and it will be safe to do so, so we can go out and collect these fish and start to do the research. So what's the research? Well, just like I was talking about in the wrasse, where they have two different kinds of males, they have two different kinds of males in this species as well. So here we are with one of our little pools. You can see there's few fish in here. And all of this yellow on the underside of the rock, those are eggs from this species. And here we have our big type one or parental male, our female, and our little type two male. And so it's the same sort of a strategy that the big type one male, he defends the territory, he makes the nest, he sings at night to attract the female, and I'll play you that sound in a second. The female will then swim into this intertidal area at night. So imagine that this beach is actually completely flooded over at night. So she can just swim right up, listen for her favorite male. We're still not exactly sure what drives her to pick one male versus another. And then she will lay her eggs. And this, down, this image down in the bottom right here that look like little tadpoles, those are the developing midshipman fish. You can see those little black dots with their eyes and the orange is the yolk that they're actually stuck to those rocks. And a really successful male, if you look at his rock during the day, will have a bunch of different groups of eggs that are different colors because she's only gonna stay for one night. She leaves the next day and then he'll sing again the next night to try to attract a different female. And he'll have multiple clutches of eggs at different stages of development and different ages all on the underside of that one rock. So you can tell the really successful males by the number of eggs stuck to their rock and the varying stages of development of those eggs. And he'll stay there for weeks during the breeding season, calling and then defending the territory. So really her job is come in, lay eggs and leave. And the type two males are the sneaker males, just like in the wrasse, their job there is to produce as many sperm as possible. They're about 40% testes relative to body weight. Think about that ratio for a second. And they, when they, the female enters the nest at night, the type two male will just stick his tail in, release sperm and take off and leave the big type one male to raise his offspring. So I'll play you what the sound, the call sounds like. So that's called a hum. And it's been compared to an electrical noise. Actually, these fish were also called the Sausalito singing fish because there was a houseboat group in Sausalito, California that was calling the electrical company and saying, what's going on? Why is there this crazy noise under all of our houseboats? We think it sounds like an electrical 60 hertz signal. No, it was that they had put their houseboats over an entire spawning population of midshipmen fish. And at night, all of the males were humming at the same time and driving the houseboat community nuts. Why we're really interested in this fish, and this gets back to my interest in hearing and communication, is because their hearing changes seasonally. And I'll just leave you with this last story here. So what you're seeing here on the x-axis or across the bottom here is frequency, and then across the side or the y-axis is hearing threshold. So the higher the number, the louder the sound has to be for the fish to hear it. And these were recordings that my colleague did from the ear of the fish. So this is the fish's ear. If you've seen one of my previous talks, you've seen pictures of fish ears before. And he's recording from the nerve that connects the ear to the brain of the fish. And so all you really need to know here is in the winter during the non-breeding season, we've got these green dots. And then in the summer during the breeding season, these are recordings from the the female, we have yellow dots and that those are lower down in the graph, meaning that she can hear softer sounds. And that's really the take home. And when he initially discovered this, he thought he had done something wrong with the experiments, went out and collected breeding females and non-breeding females again the following year and said, huh, that's real. 
there's seasonal plasticity, seasonal changes in the hearing ability of these females. And we know that it's driven by estrogen because if we take a female during the non-breeding season and we implant her with estrogen, three weeks later, her hearing improves. So it's not just that during the breeding season that these females are more attracted to the male's call, it's that they're actually better able to hear it. And we're trying to figure out why. So just to leave you with one bit of data here from some work that I published eight years ago now, this is the inner ear of a fish. This is their auditory organ. So we have what's called a cochlea. They have something similar. And each of these green dots, and this is only a couple of millimeters long, each of these green dots is a single hearing cell in the ear of the fish. And you can see that down here. This is a fluorescent image where I used a green fluorescent dye to, and a red fluorescent dye to label their hearing cells. And then we counted the number of cells and they have physically more cells in their ear that allow them to hear during the breeding season than during the non-breeding season. And so we now have a grant from the National Science Foundation to understand how estrogen changes the number of cells in the ear, but also the properties of those cells to better make them able to hear the male's call during the breeding season and out of it. And if you guys stay tuned, give me a couple of years till we're back in the field and I'll have more to that story. So just to remind you of where we started, a lot of different ways to find a date and a mate, especially if you're an animal, anything from decorating your bower and a song and a dance to the extreme examples of self-fertilization or just holding on for life. And finally, just want to mention my lab members, even though much of this was work done by colleagues at other institutions around the country and around the world. This is my research lab right here. And the, the current group in the lab, my colleague Joseph Naros at University of Washington, who has really been, been studying these midshipmen fish for 20 years. He and I have been working on them together for a bit over a decade. And I want to leave you with an appeal as well that normally I would not do at the end of a talk. This is a challenging time for all of us. And we get that. I realize that a lot of people are struggling financially. And a research lab is no different. We're really a small business where I bring in grant money and that grant money pays for my staff and my students. They are not paid by the university. I thankfully am paid by the university, but all of the other people in this picture are all paid off of my grants and many of them are students themselves. And at the current time, it's a tough choice between using the grant money to pay the student who can't do the work because we can't go into the lab or laying people off right now. And so what I'm asking people to do if you're able is to go out to my website, labs.wc.edu slash Allison Coffin. There's a donate here button. I'm looking for 200 people to each donate $25 or even $5 so that we can raise enough money that I don't have to lay people off for May with the idea that hopefully by June, we will be back to doing science again. And it's not really so much about the science itself, although that's a big part of it for this month. It's about supporting our next generation of scientists so that they can keep paying their bills until they can get back in and do the work they love. And with that, I thank you very much for all of your attention and I will take questions. And I don't- um, I have two questions really. One of them relates to the fish. You, that is, you say the fish can hear better at certain times. How do you actually tell that they're hearing better? The other part of the question is related to the birds earlier. Um, the, you said the song was related to the number or to the uh, growth of neurons or something in the brain. I was wondering if the birds might actually use the song to determine how well the brain is flourishing in the other birds. That is, there, if there might be some advantage to mating with birds that, that have a more developed brain or something, and they're using the song to determine that. Very good question. All right. I will address the fish question first. And so for the fish, there are a number of different ways that we can tell what they're hearing, right? Counting the cells is only one part of it. What we also do is we record the electrical signal from the ear. And the more intense the electrical signal, the more activity is going on in the ear. We can also record from the brain and play the fish sounds of different pitches or frequencies 
and then see how well the brain responds to those different frequencies and also then vary the intensity of the sound and see how well the brain is responding to a softer sound versus a louder sound. We can also do behavioral experiments with these guys, or these girls, as I should say, since it's the females. Although I will say those we can only do during the breeding season. During the breeding season, these fish are really highly motivated to locate a singing male. And so if you take a female during the breeding season and you put her in a big cement tank and you stick a speaker in the center and you play the male's call, or even something similar, basically just, hmm, she is right up on the speaker that night looking for the male. And so we can also tell a bit about motivation, about hearing sensitivity, and we're using these fish to understand how a fish tells where a sound is coming from in space, because it's actually a lot more complicated underwater than it is in air, by looking at her behavior as she is trying to locate that male. So a, lot, a number of different ways, everything from counting cells to recording from cells and recording from the brain to studying behavior. And that's one of the great things about this species is that we can hit all of these different levels to know, to take things from cells and molecules to behavior in a single animal, which we really like. As far as the birds go, the quality of the song is related to the quality of the male overall. And so for females that are selecting a male based on the stereotyping of a song, how repetitive it is, as well as on things like potentially complexity of the song, those definitely would be correlated with changes in the brain. And there are some bird species, and I'm forgetting which ones right now, probably some of you that are birders know that better than I do. But well, one obvious example are the mockingbirds, where it's not just a single song, but they learn new songs. And male quality is associated with the number of different songs that a male can produce. So that really gets at what you're saying, Dave, about the neural complexity being an, what we call an honest indicator of male quality because a more robust male with more neurons and more connections between them is likely to be able to produce a greater variety of songs and do it well. I was curious what the, um, the satin bowerbirds use uh, for blue items before there was plastic. A lot of it were feathers and flower petals. Do they still use those along with the plastic? They do, absolutely. It's just there's so much blue plastic now in our environment. Think about how many water bottles have blue plastic caps that they have a much easier time now finding blue objects. So that also gets at a good point about are we as humans influencing sexual selection in this species by making, by saturating the environment with blue objects? so that a lesser quality male still has plenty of opportunities to find blue stuff to decorate his bower because there's so many more blue objects in the environment. So I think that also gets at a really interesting point of how are our plastic items influencing mate choice in this species over the course of decades? Because there are a lot more blue things. It's not just a few flower petals and, and feathers anymore. Here we go. Here he is. Okay. Um, when you were doing the presentation on the Bower, I wondered if you know the old historical song of great historical importance, Will You Come to the Bower? It's a great romantic old song. Would have been a great background for that piece. Um, I got two quick <laughs> not questions. Not familiar with it. Sorry. Not, yeah, not Skrillex. Not going to happen. It's an old <laughs> Texas song. Uh, the, the, anyway, the um, first thing is, some of these behaviors, I think about singing and, and, and uh, communication by a sound show up in birds and in humans in very similar ways, which would suggest that, oh, they must go back very far since the birds are defend, des descended from the dinosaurs and we're mammals. So these things are probably like way down, way back in history and they're way down in the bottom of our brain. They may be, you know, in the lower part of the brain that we don't really uh, think of as the intellectual part. And is, is, I wonder if, if, if that's true, that, that, that it goes way back. And the other question I have is, do the demands of this sexual selection and uh, actually, are, is, that, is that what makes us as smart as we are? 
And is it is there something about it that is also makes us not any smarter than we are? Why are we so dumb? Uh, no, is that it, was a are we in the sweet spot by not being too smart and not being too dumb? I think I'm going to avoid the second question simply because I could get myself in a lot of trouble with not knowing very much and speculating a whole bunch. Yeah. But as far as the first question goes about the about vertebrate evolution of song and a lot of these behaviors relative to acoustic communication, there are more species, and I think I can say this with great confidence, there are more species, as far as we know at least, that, that don't use acoustic communication in particular, that don't use song to attract mates than that do. Mm -hmm. And it's actually thought that in humans and in songbirds that these acoustic communication strategies and learning and really learning the vocalizations that evolved independently. There doesn't seem to be a common ancestor of both that actually had learned vocalizations. The vast majority of vertebrates of animals in general don't learn their vocalizations. It's really in terms of the learning of songbirds, not even all birds, but songbirds, humans, probably bats, Give us a few more years on that research. That's a colleague of mine at WSU, Christine Portfords, but she has some interesting evidence that bats are vocal learners. And we think probably some whales and dolphins, but those are a lot harder to study in terms of manipulating their auditory environment. But no, we, we really think it's independent evolution of this Multiple. almost speech-like production in mm -hmm. songbirds and humans. And songbirds have been used as a great model for vocal learning, but the brain regions that they're using to learn and produce their song are actually quite different than the brain regions that we use. Although I will say, just to complicate things, some of the genes that are involved are similar. So there's are one particular gene called FOXP2 that we know if it's mutated causes difficulties in speech production in humans and in learning speech and the same is true in birds so some of the molecular substrate some of the dna is the same but the regions of the brain are really different and how they're put together is really different I'm so excited about this so some evolution uh, commonalities but likely parallel evolution acting on some of the same genes thank you thank you You're welcome great question love that all of this is fun and again this like i said this, this is some of this is Let's dig into the science and some of this is let's think about interesting bird and fish stories and you know get out of our heads for a little bit okay so i am rooting for and jealous of all the species that get to mate outside these days and my question is do you think that uh, social distancing and all the humans being stuck inside has made the birds and fish happy or had no effect <laughs> great question todd and yeah, TMI on that first part, but that's okay. So, although that does get to a talk from Science on Tap last Thursday. So if you guys are looking for more talks, and then I will get to your question, Todd. But that the local Science on Tap talks, which usually occur live a couple times a month, both in Portland and in Vancouver, both sides of the river, those are now virtual. Those are now every Thursday evening. And last week's was about online dating and a lot of the research around online dating, which was also fascinating. In terms of the animals, there's a fair amount of research coming out right now that more wild animals, quote unquote wild animals, are being spotted in urban areas. So increases in turkeys in urban areas, increases in coyotes in urban areas, increases in bobcat sightings, as well as we know decreases in carbon dioxide emissions and other greenhouse gases. So the animals, the environment, are in general, if again, if we can anthropomorphize, they're, they're pretty happy about the current situation, even if we're not. All right, any final questions? I know it's a bit past 11 here and that normally we would all be heading into the snack room for coffee and, and treats and that that doesn't work right now, but I brought my own coffee. <laughs> any other questions? Okay, it looks like that's it. Thank you so much, Allie, for a wonderful presentation.